Talk to me. Talk to me. And in 1928, the party received a little over 800,000 votes, or 2.6% of the votes cast, to win 12 seats in the Reichstag. But we were more than twice as popular before I went to prison, having in May of 1924 32 seats in the Reichstag. But then I was in prison, plus the period from 1924 to 1929 was known as the Golden Era. And with an improving economy, my opportunities for political agitation were limited. But in October 1929, when the stock market in the United States crashed, I mean, that all changed. I'll say, <laughs> when the market crashed, millions of Germans were thrown out of work. Several major banks collapsed on the party, and I were prepared to take advantage of the emergency to gain support, promising to repudiate the Versailles Treaty, strengthen the economy, and provide jobs. The Great Depression in Germany provided a political opportunity for you, as Germans were basically ambivalent to the parliamentary Weimar Republic, which faced strong challenges from both right and left-wing extremists. Moderate political parties were increasingly unable to stem the tide of extremism, and the German referendum of 1929, which formally renounced the Treaty of Versailles and made it a criminal offense for German officials to cooperate in the collecting of World War I reparations, well, that helped elevate Nazi party ideology. Yeah, the referendum was spearheaded by nationalist politician und media baron Alfred Hugenberg, who set up the League of Many Right-Wing Organizations to campaign together, including my Nazi party. He admired our dynamism and youthful enthusiasm and gave us free publicity in his widely read newspapers, making me a household name in Deutschland. <laughs> And by having the Nazi party campaigning for the referendum, I mean, alongside other mainstream right-wing parties, I mean, it gave you a credibility you had previously lacked. The elections of September 1930 resulted in a new chancellor, Heinrich Brüning of the Center Party, who governed through emergency decrees from President Paul von Hindenburg and with a minority cabinet. And in those elections, the Nazi party rose from obscurity to win 18.3% of the vote, over 6.4 million votes in total, and 107 parliamentary seats becoming the second largest party in parliament. Chancellor Bruning's austerity measures brought little economic improvement and were extremely unpopular which you exploited by targeting political messages, specifically at those most affected by the inflation of the 1920s and the Depression, such as farmers, war veterans, and the middle class. Yeah, not unlike today in much of the world, especially in those countries which enacted austerity measures, thinking they would be effective. Why, even in the United States, there are right-wing politicians seeking to pass austerity measures and then blame the left for the plight of those most affected by them, such as farmers and war veterans, and whatever middle class is still left in America. Glad to see my policies still being used by the right. <laughs> and in that year, you ran against von Hindenburg in the presidential elections, having the support of many of Germany's most powerful industrialists. Now again, not unlike many of the right-wing politicians in the United States today. Still, in speeches I gave during this period, I stressed the peaceful goals of my policies on the willingness to work with international agreements. At the first meeting of my cabinet in 1933, I must admit that I did prioritize military spending over unemployment relief. Well, I mean, so much for promises to help the unemployed. And not unlike what right-wing Congress members have been attempting to do for the past six years, nothing to help the economy or put people back to work while seeking to increase military spending. 
On May 1, 1933, with many trade union delegates in Berlin for May Day or International Workers' Day activities, SA stormtroopers demolished union offices around the country. And on the next day, May 2nd, all trade unions were forced to dissolve and their leaders were arrested, some of whom were sent to concentration camps that were hastily erected in February 1933, immediately after you became chancellor and the Nazi party was given control over the police with the appointment of Frick and Goering. Also in August 1934, you appointed Reichsbank President Yalmar Schacht as Minister of Economics and in the following year as plenipotentiary for war economy, in charge of preparing the economy for war. Reconstruction and rearmament were financed through printing money, seizing the assets of people arrested as enemies of the state, including Jews, and MIFO bills. Ah, brilliant man, that Yalmar Schacht. He created a limited liability company, which was called MIFO for short. It had no actual existence or operations and was solely a balance sheet entity. Still, it issued MIFO bills as bills of exchange, convertible into Reichsmarks upon demand. These bills provided the way for the Reichsbank to lend the government money that it normally or legally could not do and enable Germany to legally rearm without leaving a paper trail. And I have little doubt that those in today's financial industry are playing the same type of games with phony corporations in order to hide and make money. Yeah, I have little doubt too, since they learned from us. Why, some may off even be descendants of Nazi party members. <laughs> Talk to me.